and support. Okay, so Ashley's gonna talk about what should you know? All right, so. Thank you, girl. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. So, first of all, getting started. So, with your with your business, um, or actually with your grant, all grants go to a particular business. So, it doesn't go to an individual person. So, you have to register your business with the state. You have to make sure you have an EIN number, and you have to file all the necessary paperwork so that you have a registered business. And then from there, you need to make sure that you have a um, DUN number. Um, that's part of DUN and Bradstreet, um, kind of the credit business bureau. Um, so you can make sure you have that. For some of the grants, you'll need that. And then you wanna start searching. You wanna start looking around for grants that will be applicable for you and your business. Again, think about your chambers, reach out to them. Um, stay connected um, to what your, your communications and what they're sending out so that you see those alerts and that's on your radar if there's something that stands out to you. Start looking around for a grant that would be good for you. Also think about some of those other um, organizations that we shared with you earlier, um, like the Fairfield County Found the Fairfield Foundation, um, the Fairfield County Economic Development, those grants. Start looking around to see what will work for you. And then once you find something that stands out to you that you want to go for, look at your eligibility, look at their criteria, look at what they're asking you to do um, and follow all of those steps so that you can go ahead and get started on getting that grant submitted. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about some of those tips and tricks that you guys asked for. And um, this is going to be most of the meat because I'm sure that you've um, probably know a lot of the stuff we've already talked to you. Maybe you grabbed a few little tidbits, but um, hopefully this is some, some of the things that'll help you, these tips and tricks. Okay, so I'm not gonna read all these to you because I know this is complete common sense. 12 grant writing rules. Um, you would think that every single person would know that this is the, you know, the absolute things that you should do when you're writing a grant, but every grant writing uh, book that I, wrote that I read, I didn't write any of them. <laughs> Everyone that I read said these things over and over again. Basically all of the sections that were about the people that read grants and talked about the things that caused them to reject grants were these very simple things like uh, spelling problems, grammar problems, not being clear, over exaggerating, all of these things like not backing up what you say, not having any proof for what you're asking about, these very simple things that you think that everyone would know and we would be common sense are really the pitfalls that cause people to lose their grants. So just read through these 12 rules, use that common sense and make sure that you're checking off those boxes on these simple things as you're writing through your grants, okay? Simple things, but they really make a difference. Okay. So these are, this is kind of the meat, right? This is where you wanna make sure that these are, the, these are the most important things to do as you're writing your grant. Know the grant maker because the underlying tone of your proposal should show that you understand their mission and yours and how your grant goals support both, okay? So you wanna know the person that is offering the grant. You wanna know what they're really looking for you wanna make sure that you are telling a story that is impactful. You wanna make sure that you are engaging them and that they can see what you're talking about coming to life if they, get, they give you the money to support your program. Know the field. So understand what has worked successfully, do your research. What has worked successfully in this area and what has not? And how is what you're proposing going to be the next success? If you're proposing something that's been done before and hasn't worked, how are you going to make it work this time? If you're proposing something that's worked successfully, how is yours different from the last thing that's worked? And how are you going to take it to the next level? So this is one of the things that you hear again and again and again. Follow the guidelines. 
every grant, they have spent so much time putting together the guidelines and it could be the simplest thing. I just applied for a grant where the very first piece of el eligibility was that you could not apply unless you were within a 10 mile radius of a Dollar General store. So the very first thing I did before I even started applying for the grant was looked up how close we were to the Dollar General store and made sure that we had that eligibility. Follow those guidelines. Clearly state, this is just, it's so simple, but these are the things that cause the pitfalls. State what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and how you arrived at the budget to complete it. It's really that simple. It's 500 words means 500 words. If they say this particular section, only write 500 words about how you're going to do this thing. If you write 600, they're going to disqualify you. If they say give us three examples and you give them four, they're going to disqualify you. Your budget should be able to stand alone as a representation of your project. Basically, your budget should say, here's what I plan to do with this money. They should be able to look at that and know what your program is without ever looking at your program. Be on time. That seems so simple as well. But honestly, the first people to apply are often the first people to receive the grants. So you want to make sure that you submit your grant in a timely manner. And if it's past the deadline, it's not going to be considered. So make sure that you're on time with your grants. Make sure that you document, that you send the correct documents and you thoroughly go through that checklist several times. If they want a cover sheet and an addendum and letters of support and an appendix and your finance officer to sign off on a paper that says that you will support the grant financially on your end. All those things have to be included. Check the boxes. Make sure every single thing they're asking for is included. Those things are very, very important as you're applying for those grants. Okay, so let me see if I can move this little box that's like right in the middle of all my stuff I'm trying to talk about. Okay. So when you are writing your proposal, these are great tips. Talk about your goals and objectives. It is not enough to talk about your great program if you don't talk about what it's supposed to do. So you want to talk about what you're out, you know, what your what's your goal. This is my great program, but what it, what am I going to do with this great program? Talk about your outcomes. What will be the in, impact? And then how are you going to measure that success? Include a timeline and benchmarks. So how often are you going to check in on success and what are you going to use to measure that success? Just make sure that your goals and objectives and outcomes fit within the guidelines of the grant maker. So if they say that they want you to use certain measurements, then those have to be the measurements that you use in your program as well. Show the need and back it up with current data. If so, I just applied for a grant where um, the, the need was for workforce development. So I had to go through and look at Pickerington data and look at where, um, you know, where was the unemployment level and what was it currently and how was it impacted by the current pandemic? And why did we need to have um, programs for workforce development? So make sure if you're going to, submit something that you're going to do, you have to show the need for what you're going to ask for and back it up with the data that proves that you need it. Be able to prove sustainability beyond the grant because they want to see that you can continue to do whatever you're asking for after their grant funding has ended because they don't want to just give you grant funding for something that's going to last for a short time. They want to be able to fund you for something that's going to be able to continue. So they want to see how if they give you the money now, you can take that and sustain it beyond that grant funding time. Think about all your in-kind contributions because there are a lot of things that you're going to be doing in addition to the grant that to run whatever you're going to do that shows that you have a commitment to the project, right? So think about all the things you're going to do. You, you know, if you're going to have a copy machine and paper and ink and all those kind of things, those are your in-kind contributions because they wanna see that you're supporting the project just as much as they're funding the project. So think about those things, what they are, and talk about those as well when you're applying for the grant. And then look for those collaborations and partnerships. 
Because if you have others in the community that are supporting you in your endeavor and you can get letters from them, or you can talk about how they're supporting you, then that shows that you have support for your application. And it's not just you applying, but there's others in the community and others around you that are supporting you as well. These are really great things that'll help you, help you really have that, um, that extra, I don't even know what to call it, but it's that extra little, these things will give you that edge. That's what it is. These things will give you that edge when you're applying. All right, let's go down to the, oops, can't get it to advance now. Hold on a second. Okay, last slide. We're gonna talk about, remember what I said, we would come back to what the library can do, to, do for you. We're gonna talk about our new community resources center that we're getting ready to launch. You're gonna see the marketing for this very soon. And um, these are some of these things you're gonna, hopefully say, we didn't know you guys did that. <laughs> All right, so the library is here for you. And we have, we have so, many, so many resources available to serve your business wherever you are, um, and even what you're trying to accomplish. So we have job searching. Uh, we can help you with applications. Um, helping find jobs, um, helping you with the grant application assistance. Uh, we are here to help you with all of that. Um, device management, social media training. A lot of businesses are using social media. You know, social media is the thing uh, for businesses to promote your know, new Instagram and Twitter, um, Facebook, whatever you want to use. We can help you with that. Um, learning how to you know, maneuver all those little, you know, um, you know, all that content. We can help you with that so that you can market your business, resume writing, um, computer skills. Like if you're trying to learn some basic or advanced computer skills for, you know, maybe, you know, recording your business information, we can help you with that. Um, language learning materials. Maybe you're trying to do business with a, a company that's in an another country and there's a language barrier, we can help you with that. We have some good resources over here. Um, also business startup support. We can help you find all that. How to find um, information on the Secretary of State's website. How to find the application to register your business. Where's the application for, um, how do I get my EIN number? Where is all this stuff? Um, how do I get that done number? Where do I go to look for that? You know, some people just don't know where to look for it because there is so much content out there, but we can help you filter through all that to find exactly what you need. And, you know, for your business, you might need a website. You know, that's a great way for people to see what you have and what you have available. So we have some tech trainers here where you can come on in or you can book a one-on-one -on -one appointment to meet with them, to sit down. Certainly we're, we're keeping our distance, but we can still work with you one-on-one -on -one to help you build a website, um, to make yourself more marketable, to get your products, to get your information, to get your content out there so that people can find you. We can help you with everything. So um, whatever you're looking for, whatever questions you have, check out us at the library. We are here to help. We're friendly as well. Um, and we want to make sure that you're successful um, personally and even professionally. <laughs> so, um, and I did just want to uh, let you guys know that we've started a new community partnership with the um, Cultivate Entrepreneur um, incub or Business Incubator that's in Pickerington. I don't know if you guys have been working with Matt over there at Cultivate, but that is a great place to get some information, especially if you're doing business startup. But um, the way that we're supporting them is we are writing a monthly business blog that supports the uh, monthly training event that he has. So um, he has a topic every month that he's training and we write a blog that has um, books and resources that match up with his topic. And so if you guys, any of the nonprofits ever have anything um, that you can think of a way that we can partner with you as well, and you would like to reach out to us and um, talk about how we can support your nonprofit and partner, let us know because um, you know, we want community partnerships that 
help us to promote your nonprofit and you, and you know, he promotes us, sends his clients to us to get business help. And we send our customers to him to get entrepreneur help. And so it's a great partnership. And that's the kind of thing that we want to do because um, one of our huge goals for um, 2021 here at the library is recover. And uh, that means helping our community recover and that we wanna be here to do that. So um, thank you for letting us talk to you today. Thank you for letting us do our little library commercial. And um, do you guys have any questions for us before we move on to the next, uh, next group? Um, what I was going to share with everyone um, it, is if you do have questions, please put them in the chat box and we will try to get everything answered before the end of today's program. And if we have to follow up, we can absolutely do that as well. Um, this is being recorded. And what I will say, Jennifer, is first of all, thank you and Ashley both. Um, such great information. And I there was comments in the chat box, um, you know, with, wow, this is such great information. I didn't know that. Um, social media training and, and I need to get over there and get some help. So um, such a great opportunity to learn and um, understand a little bit more what the library can do. And I think that's one thing that, you know, Tony and I discuss quite a bit is how can we share with our business community the benefits of, you know, the library and, and what those things, what, what all you can do. Um, and Janice just posted a question, what fees are involved with the library assistance and I don't want to speak for you guys, but I'm going to say, to the best of my knowledge, none. So it's I'm all free. Yes. <laughs> all free. So that is, you know, um, something that I think as a community, as a business community, and even as residents, we don't always pay attention to um, the, the asset that our library offers. So again, I just want to say thank you. And again, if you guys have questions, throw them in the chat box. We'll get them answered before the end of today's program. And if we have to follow up, we will absolutely do that as well. Yeah, and we'll share our slides. Um, we'll email them to you. Um, we were hoping to get the Pickerington Library branding on them, but we couldn't figure out how to do it. And we definitely have to do that. Otherwise, you know, your board member and our director won't be a happy man. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, well, thank you again. Um, we certainly appreciate your, your time and sharing of knowledge. And I'm excited to... Um, introduce our next speaker, Ella Glasgow, who is um, a, I'm just going to go right into her bio because she's just, she's just awesome. So Ella Glasgow is an award-winning vocalist, two-time best-selling author, mommy to a precocious almost six-year-old, and the CEO producer at Beyond Virtual Events. Meeting planners hire her to create impactful virtual events so they can wow their community, increase connections, and commitment to their cause without pulling their hair out, trying to deal with the logistics and delivery of their events. She does this using her signature Encore method for transformational virtual experiences that have their audiences wanting to pay cash money to attend again and again. So join me in welcoming Ella Glasgow. dream is a wish your heart makes when you're fast asleep. In dreams you will lose your heartaches. What
good morning, good morning. I hope that you are having an amazing morning. I am so excited to be here with you. And you know, when I think of that song, it brings back so many memories. I can think of so many experiences that I've had in relation to that song. And I want to know from all of you now, and I can see you all, I want to know from all of you now, I want you to go ahead and unmute your mic and let me know, shout it out, when you hear that song, when you first heard that music playing, what was it that came to your mind? Go ahead and unmute yourself and let me know, what, what were you thinking? What memories came up for you? Or you can pop it into the chat. What memory came up for you when you hear that particular song? I can see you smiling there, Joe Welsh. <laughs> Go ahead and let me know. I want to know. I really do want to know. No memories at all came up for you when you heard that song? <laughs> I'm the only one who has those memories. <laughs> Hello, yes, Elizabeth. okay, there we go. I see those coming into the chat now. Yes, singing with my daughter, the princess and the frog, and of course, Disney. Of course, Disney. <laughs> Whenever I'm thinking about virtual events, there are so many things and so many wonderful pieces that come to creating a virtual event and having someone have a great experience is one of the things that we really want to be mindful of when we're thinking about putting our events together. And today, when I found out, well, not today, when I found out, when a few weeks ago, when uh, Libby contacted me and Teresa contacted me about this particular event, I was really excited because I knew that we were going to get to talk about how to make your virtual events even better so that you could create those impactful experiences, especially when you're running a business and you are wanting people to really connect with your cause. You really want to be thinking about how can we help my audience how can we help your audience really connect to what it is that you are wanting them to connect to? How can you help them really internalize your message so that they become ambassadors for what it is that you're doing? And now we're in this incredible virtual world that we can create so many wonderful things for our audiences in a way that we haven't been able to do before. But the truth of the matter is, there is a lot that goes into creating a virtual event. And it takes more than simply turning on Zoom and calling it a day and inviting people to come. There are so many other pieces that are involved and so many things that I could talk with you about today. But as I was thinking about what I wanted to give to you, I had to think about what are the key foundational pieces that really help us at Beyond Virtual Events to have events that really are impactful, that really do allow us to help our clients communicate their message in a way that has their audience really wanting to pay that cash money to attend again and again. And if you are a nonprofit, then you want your audience to pay cash money to attend again and again, because they are your lifeblood. So let's get all the way into it. Like I said, there are quite a few things that I could talk about when it comes to creating your virtual event and really up-leveling. Today, I'm going to give you some things to help you power shift to the next level. And the first power shift, shift I would like to talk about are those experiences. And when we think about experiences, there are so many definitions 
for the word experience, everybody's got a different idea of what that actually means. And there are things that we should be thinking about when we're looking at experiences for our clients. We are thinking about not just the event itself. There are pieces that come into play before the event even happens. And I encourage you to be thinking about that as well. It's not just what happens at the event that causes your attendee, your audience to be really excited about being there. The experience has to begin before the event happens. And that means that you have to get people excited in a way that they may not have even been excited before because here's the thing, chicken wings. Everybody's doing virtual events now and you have to figure out a way to make them want to come to yours. And it would seem that it would be a challenge because everybody's doing virtual events now. But the fact of the matter is events were happening long before COVID and you were having to compete long before COVID and long before virtual. We're just now in a new space. So when you're thinking about your event and you're thinking about creating those experiences, I want you to be thinking not just about the event itself, but everything that's leading up to the event. That means your landing page, because that is the first instance that somebody has to actually experience you and your cause and what it is that you're about. And if you are not taking the time to craft a really compelling landing page that gives them a reason to want to take time out of their day to come and spend time with you and give you money to do it, then you are going to see fewer and fewer people coming to your events. And I'm going to mesh virtual and in-person events together. Because if you haven't given them a reason to come, they ain't coming. <laughs> so put all of those pieces together for yourself. And in fact, I would love for you right now, I want you to think about a time that you had an amazing experience. I want you to go back in your memories now. It could have been something that happened recently. It could have been something that happened a long time ago. But whatever that experience was, I want you to think of one that you have said to yourself, I will, when you were in it, you were like, I will never, I will never forget this. This was incredible. And I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to write that down. I want you to write that down. What was that experience that you had that was so incredible? And because I'm me, I can't just give you a couple of minutes in silence. I don't want you to have a couple, Libby's shaking her head. She says, Ella can't give a couple of minutes in silence. So I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes memory jogging music and I'll be back in a couple of minutes.
All right. I can see some people thinking. I saw some people writing. And I want to hear from uh, one or two of you about the experiences that you had that you remember that you were just like, oh my God, I will never forget this experience. So let me see here who who can raise their hand. I want to hear from maybe one or two of you about the experiences that you wrote down that you will just never, ever, 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 ever forget. Let me see here. Go ahead and raise your hand or and we can you can wave wildly at me. <laughs> Hey, I see you, Sally. I'm passing the mic on over to you. So go on ahead and uh, unmute yourself and let us know what was that experience that you had that you will just never, ever forget. It was uh, going on a shark feeding dive in St. Martin. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I've been to St. Martin and I would totally not forget that. <laughs> um I did not go on a shark dive in St. Martin. That's incredible. That is definitely an experience to remember. What was so memorable about it for you? What made you besides the fact that there were sharks all around you? Why was that so memorable for you? It um it really pushed past my comfort zone as far as being a scuba diver. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you start to go down, we were 60 feet down in the water. As soon as you start to go down, the sharks are circling that because they know what's coming. <laughs> yeah, food. <laughs> food. Oh, yes. Not you, not you, not you. <laughs> no, it's not me. Now, there was only one person feeding the sharks. <laughs> but uh, just the fact that the sharks were just just zooming over your shoulder and zooming up over your head. Um, and my son, my youngest son was with me and he took a picture of a shark and it's just basically the mouth of a shark, you know, that's oh just my coming over his head. It's one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> that is incredible. So tell me when, before you took that incredible adventure, <laughs> what led up to that? What made you say, I'm going to go feed some sharks, and I'm going to go do it with these people. It's just something I've always wanted to do. Yeah. Since I, since I got scuba certified. That's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for uh, letting us know about that awesome experience. I am like, yeah, like I said, I've been to St. Martin and I'm not trying to be with the sharks at all. In fact, I'm partially Caribbean. My father is from Trinidad. So technically I should love being in the water and I should love being in the ocean, but I don't. <laughs> I love to be on top of the water on a cruise ship where nothing can harm me. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I would love to hear from one more person about what you wrote down. What was that incredible experience that you remembered? Go ahead and raise your hand, wave at me, wave wildly at me so that I can see that you're there. Hey, there you are, Libby. I'll share if nobody else will, but um, I would love I'd, to hear from you. Yeah, mine isn't nearly as adventurous. Um, so, my granddaughter's seventh birthday two years ago, she loves ballet, lives, lives it, breathes it, wants to be a ballerina. And my daughter ran into this woman who, who um, had a birthday party at their house. But the actual sugar plum fairy who dances in the, who, in the Nutcracker, at least that year she was, um, you know, downtown Columbus, um, 
was was the was the host of the birthday party and literally just the look on the face of my granddaughter will forever be etched in my memory and she she just kind of stood there like you know the whole time she just was like oh my god I can't believe the sugar plum fairies in my living room teaching me how to do ballet moves right yes oh my gosh okay if I had the sugar plum fairy at my house like that would be amazing that would be awesome I would love that so much and I want to share with you a memory that I have that I know that I will never ever ever forget it was something that is actually pretty recent. And uh, depending on whether or not you're friends with me on Facebook, you may or may not have seen this incredible memory that I will never, ever, ever forget uh, that I shared with my son last evening. So let me show you my current favorite memory. Okay, I'll go to the others. Yeah, you ready? Yeah. And mark. I'm going to lie on the face. last night. I will never forget this memory, mainly because that ball is still downstairs and I will totally be bouncing on that today. But (laughs) why is all of this important? Well, first I want to, I want you to think about Libby's memories. And I want you to think about Sally's memories, those experiences that they had when it comes to your virtual event you have an opportunity to create memories for your audience. And when it comes to getting them into the mindset of having those memories made long before the event happens, even though Sally may not remember why she chose to go on a boat with those people into shark infested waters and Libby may not remember why she chose that particular sugar plum fairy, but I can bet your bottom dollar that those people, when they put their pieces together for their particular uh, services that they were selling on their landing page somewhere, it tapped into a memory, a desire, something that made them say, I'm going to choose to spend my time with you. On Sally's page, whatever she saw, whatever she clicked on, however she got there, whoever she talked to, if it was on a cruise ship, she talked to somebody and said they, they told her that she could go on this incredible, uh, incredible adventure and swim with sharks which tapped into an old desire, an unrevealed desire that they didn't necessarily know, but they knew because they were, she was their ideal target market. And when you're thinking about your experiences that you're creating, you have to tap into those old memories and those desires that your audience wants to have. And I'm going to give you a new definition of experience. This is my definition of experience. And that is experience is the memories that you give your audience long after the event is over. It is not just about having the experience or a bunch of other tools of engagement and all of these other things. It really is about the memories because at the end of the day, 
you're a business owner. And if they don't remember you and the experience that they had with you, they will not be buying from you. <laughs> so you want them to have a great experience. You want to make opportunities that are incognito. These are undercover experiences. You don't have to let them know that they're having them. Think about Disney. When you go to Disney, if you've never been before, I'm going to try and explain this to you now. When you go to Disney, there are so many things happening behind the scenes that are unknown to you to help you have what makes you feel like you're having a choose your own adventure experience. Those are key words. I said, it makes you feel like you're having a choose your own adventure experience. Every single thing in Disney World is planned. Every single thing. You have to start thinking about your virtual events. In fact, all of your events, in person and virtual, you need to start thinking of them that way. Which leads me to the second power shift that I really want you to think about. When it comes to creating those experiences and having those moments, we really have to get intentional and purposeful with our engagement. There are so many ways that we could engage. We can use the chat, we can use polls, we can use all of these things. But if you are not purposeful with your engagement, any tool that you use to engage will fall flat. So I'm going to call myself out and I'm going to let you see behind the scenes just a little bit. You notice that I have actually used a few forms of engagement. I engaged your voice. I engaged your fingers which engages the sense of touch when I asked you to put them things into the chat. I asked you, I engaged your sense of thought and memory because I asked you to remember experiences that you've had. All of these things that I'm doing, and now you're going to be paying attention to it for the rest of the time that we're here together. And you'll never forget this ever again. Every single thing that I'm doing today is intentful because at the end of the day, I would love for you to work with me. So I wanted you to have a powerful experience and I am locking and engaging your memory of me with the memories that you already have that are great because I asked you in the beginning to think of a fabulous experience that you had that you will never forget. These are the secret sauces, so don't tell anybody, of virtual events. This is how you get your people to really want to stick with you when you are having your virtual event. And I'm looking at my time. Oh my gosh, there's so many things I want to talk with you about and I don't want to go over time. So I am going to zip through the next things that I wanted to give to you today. So I want you to, um, I'm going to give you one more thing that can help you to power shift your virtual experiences. And this is something that may not seem uh, relevant to every single event, but I've seen it happen and you've seen this happen more than once. I want you to think about embracing the silence. There is a functionality in Zoom that you need to be aware of. It is called the mute all button. <laughs> It's your power tool. <laughs> How many times have you been to a Zoom meeting in the past year? Somebody was unmuted. 
and they disrupted the whole meeting, took everything off the train. We were having a good old time. We were thinking about what was going on. And then suddenly somebody unmuted or felt that they needed to be a part of the conversation and put themselves onto the stage. And they started talking or somebody came in and some loud noise, a dog barked, all of the things, right? If you will use the power of the mute all and not just the mute all, you're gonna have to go look at this later, okay? If you click on more in Zoom after opening up the participants panel, when you click on more, you have a little window there that will open up and it says allow participants to unmute themselves or name themselves, start video. You are going to uncheck, allow participants to unmute themselves. <laughs> I know that seems like such a small thing, but at the end of the day, it's the little things that make your events memorable, that you really craft the experience that your attendee has. And it's not just holding that mute button down. You need to know when to let go of the unmute so that people can talk. <laughs> but you really are able to craft the entire experience that your audience has. It's not just about the bells and whistles. I'm excited that I get to have bells and whistles. And when we work with our clients at our higher levels, we give them bells and whistles too. But if we didn't have the foundation laid, none of the bells and whistles would matter. So take these key pieces that I'm giving you today and just so that you remember what they are, that first piece there, remember I gave you three things I kind of zipped through, is first, meaningful experiences. Giving your audience meaningful experiences. Number two, purposeful engagement. Do not use a poll if your poll has absolutely nothing to do with what you're talking about and will not lead them to your ultimate goal. Number three, power mute. It is your power shift of the day. <laughs> Use it, love it, own it. <laughs> and with that, thank you so much. I had such an incredible time being here with you all today. And I would love to hear from any of you if there's any help that you need, any more help that you need with your um, experiences, helping to put those experiences together and uh, talk with you about how you can up-level your next virtual event. Thank you so much for having me, Teresa. Ella, thank you so much. That was awesome. And I hope that everybody that is on this call um, learned some fun things and some ways to um, enhance their virtual exper event experience and opportunities. And I think we're all going to judge every virtual event that we're ever going to be on ever again because of this. So, <laughs> um, so don't judge us. We're, we're the chamber. We're boring. Um, no, we're trying. Um, we're trying to definitely give everybody that opportunity and that experience. So um, once again, if you have questions for Ella, please put them in the chat box. We'll make sure to get those answered before we wrap up today. Or again, we will follow up. This is being recorded and we will share and we'll also share our speakers information with everyone so that you can reach out and certainly um, have that opportunity to connect with our speakers. So very excited to move into our last presentation. Um, with Libby, and I'm going to do this and hopefully not screw it up. Libby Villavicencio. She knows strong communities and great organizations do not happen by chance. They have strong leadership in place, a definition of the impact they want to have, a clear path for achieving their impact, and the right people on the bus in the right seats. Libby helps communities and organizations line up everything they need to achieve stronger results than ever before. She is nationally respected for her work with communities, government, higher education, nonprofit, and philanthropic organizations. So we are talking partnerships and how to leverage those. And Libby, you are going to take it away. Thank you. I um, have just a couple of things I wanted to interject while I'm getting my screen shared. Um, one is the those resources from the library are fantastic. I wonder if you could pop in the chat a link to like online resources 
Do you mind doing that? Like just sharing with us a link that will, will take us to what online resources are available right now. I'd appreciate that. Um, and then um, Ella mentioned dogs. I just will say one of my dogs may bark. <laughs> I have a barker. Um, he has become part of my work life every day, um, unfortunately. And then the other thing is that there's a, I sort of, I try to stay on top of, of research and trends in the nonprofit world and virtual events are here to stay. That is the word, um, you know, right now. And so I, I think it's not just like, thinking about that you might need to have virtual events in the future, um, people are going to demand them. And so I think it's, it behooves us all to become good at uh, planning and executing virtual events. So um, with that, I'd love to spend a little bit of time talking about um, how you could leverage your partnerships for greater impact. Um, you know, I've, I've been in the nonprofit world since 19, uh -huh, yeah. And uh, back in the day when they first started talking about partnerships, it was the funders sort of saying, nonprofits need to collaborate, nonprofits need to collaborate. Any of you remember those days? Um, without really any look at why or what the result would be, we sort of felt like to be compliant and to appeal to our funders, we had to collaborate. And so we kind of looked around at each other like, hey, you wanna collaborate? Cause I can say now that I'm collaborating and I can put that in my grant application and let my funders know now I'm collaborating. And so what happened was we, we thought we, you know, we, hang, we hung our hat and wore our badge around. I've got a list of 10 collaborators. And uh, what did collaboration mean back then? It meant that we, we said we would be a collaborator. So we got on the list. And then our collaboration might be, well, we meet once a year to talk about how we might exchange clients or refer to each other. And that was about it. But over the years, it's evolved and we've become smarter. And we sort of um, have gotten to a point now where we know we have to partner um, if we're going to have the greatest impact that we can have. Um, and I like that trend in really having meaningful partnerships. So today we'll talk about you know, how do you select the right partners, the right partners, quote unquote, um, and what sort of makes a good partnership or defines a good partnership? Um, and how do you create a win-win-win? Uh, not just a win-win, but a win-win-win. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And I want this to be interactive. I know that we're here today uh, and I'm sharing some information about partnership and you all are smarter than me and you've probably done some great partnering and I would love to hear about that. So, um, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to just unmute yourself and yell out your question. Um, Cause I'd like to, this to be more interactive than not. Um, so today what I'd like to talk about is two types of partnerships. Um, nonprofits partnering with one another which I started out talking about and then nonprofits and corporations partnering. I hope that works for folks. Happy to answer any, any questions about anything else. So let's start with nonprofits working together. So why and how do nonprofits work together? Um, and, and we sort of categorize these into three different buckets of, of the why. Um, for additional efficiency, meaning reducing time and resources, to be more effective, meaning you're increasing the outcomes through improved programs and services, um, and maybe increasing your capacity. So maybe alone, you could serve 100 people together with this other partner, you might be able to serve 200. Um, and then for social and systems change. And that means really levering, leveraging these outcomes, these organizations coming together to bring about some type of external change. Um, and so those are really the buckets. And why those are important is that you should define why you're partnering upfront. What, what results do you expect to get that you're not getting at the time? Um, and if you can't find that reason, then you have to question why you would partner with that person. There, you know, is there another reason? Um, again, this historically we were pushed to say we were collaborators without really having any different results than we had before we were collaborating, right? So how do nonprofits work together? 
And these uh, really fall into these buckets, um, the three C's, um, cooperation. So typically this is like a short-term kind of informal thing. Um, it might be around one period of time. It might be around one event. It might be around you know one um, season or whatever it is. Um, these are typically low risk. They're not usually, there's not a written agreement or anything. They're just, uh, you know, very informal and exchange. You can even exchange tangible and intangible resources during this. Um, but the notion is that it's just a time limited one kind of one time thing. Um, coordination is more formal um, and it's where you have specific efforts or programs and that you, um, I'll open up your resources to your partner and they open up theirs to you. You also share the re rewards. So there's a, a, you know, in that there's a greater degree of commitment, time and resources. So it's much, much more that you're, um, you're coming together and sharing of those resources. And frequently, and it should result in larger gains around efficiency and effectiveness. And then collaboration, that C word that's been thrown around for so many years and has been kind of misused and misdefined. Um, it's a more durable and pervasive relationship, okay? It's not just, well, we meet once a year or we refer, part, we refer clients to each other. Um, it's much more than that, right? It often results in a new structure and a shared mission even. So sometimes um, organizations will partner on an initiative that they've decided to do together and they give it a na different name and a, and a mission. And again, the, the uh, resources are pooled um, or they go out together and sec secure resources to cover um, the initiative. And again, the results are shared as well as the rewards in this model. Um, and there's nothing really fancy about this. It's literally just coming together, defining what you want to do together that's different than what you can do separately. And so in, um, in these efforts, you know, one plus one doesn't equal two, it equals three or 10 or a hundred or a thousand, meaning when you come together, the results are magnified. And that should be the, the reason you come together. Um, and so when I say set up the win, 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 that's what I mean. I mean that the win is for you, the win is for your partner or your partners, and the win is for your clients, and the win is for the community, and the win, you know, you keep, the wins just keep being multiplied. So um, when you start thinking about partnering and collaborating, just some guidelines, be clear on the why. It's really critical. You can't, you should not move forward until you define a why. And the why needs to be a collective why. Be agnostic on the how. And what, what I mean by that is stay open-minded about how you might partner and, and, and kind of figure it out once you define the why. And be agnostic on who. Um, be open to partners that you might not have thought about. Um, Understand the value that you're adding to your partners, be clear about that. And also know your limits. Um, and that can be limits in a lot of ways. That can be limits in your values. It could be limits in what resources that you have that you can share. Um, it's okay to not give away everything to your partners, right? You need to understand where your limits are. I'm gonna talk about now nonprofits and corporations partnering. Um, we often don't in the nonprofit sector, I think we've gotten better about this, but for a long time, we didn't think about um, businesses and corporations being partners. We thought of them as being funders, sort of a one way relationship, you know, that they would give to us, but that we weren't really in a partnership. Um, and that is shifting, and I think it's a wonderful shift, and I absolutely think it's the right way to do things. So I, I tend to think that way, and so you're going to see that reflected in the conversation about this, and I, I would love your thoughts about how you're doing that. So 
um, a, a nonprofit uh, business relationship is a relationship in which a nonprofit organization and a corporate sponsor or partner join forces to meet a common goal on the basis of their shared values. That's critical. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So why and how do nonprofits and corporations partner? Well, the why is more operating funds. That's sort of a no brainer, right? Um, corporations and businesses um, do have the, uh, you know, the responsibility and the desire um, to help nonprofit partners to make their communities and help their customers to live more enhanced lives. Um, businesses and nonprofits are both focused on en enhancing community standing, especially the business, the corporation or um, smaller business. They want to improve their standing among their customers and in their community. Um, you can get an increased volunteer pool with, by partnering, which is wonderful if you need volunteers. And then um, uh, the partnership with businesses also can help um, increase your influence and the business partner's influence. So it's really um, beneficial for both parties. It can be if it's set up the right way. And it should be. So how do they partner? Um, corporate sponsorship, obviously that's a big one and trends are showing that corporate sponsorship is just gonna in keep increasing because corporations see it as a big win um, and nonprofits are getting much better at, at asking for that kind of support. Um, that is a trend that will continue. So I highly recommend that you figure out how to do this right figure out who you should be partnering with as far as businesses and corporations and, um, and attracting their sponsorship. Um, you can get direct donations too, but either cash or in kind. Um, a lot of the, the businesses will, will give away stuff, um, whether that is stuff that they produce as the business or office equipment or you know um, helping you in some kind of in kind way through volunteering. Um, but they also, um, many corporations, uh, you know, provide a way for their uh, employees to just donate cash to organizations that they like. Um, they, they have volunteer programs. Um, and I will give you this hint, if you want to ask for corporate sponsorship, it would behoove you to figure out how to engage some of the corporation's employees to volunteer at your event that you're asking for sponsorship or in your programs or both. Um, they often have workplace giving opportunities um, and you can access that as well. Um, often they'll match their employees gifts to you. So you wanna make sure you know if it's a business that matches their employees donations. You can of often double your do the donation amount by getting that matching dollar. Um, Corporate partners in fundraising is a great way. So if you really get into a great uh, partnership with a, a business, you can tap um, into lots of ways to do fundraising at the business or with their employees. And then through cause marketing, and this is a huge trend out there in the marketplace of finding a common cause and working together to solve it. So hunger is a, a great example, right? You've probably all seen that wonderful chef who has um, taken it upon himself to feed um, people following, um, you know, things like hurricanes and, um, you know, he's just, and he, he, is a, he is a corporation who has decided and it makes sense, right? He's a chef, he's a wonderful human being and he's out there partnering with community organizations to get people fed. Um, and there are so many benefits for the right corporate partner if you set it up in the right way. And I hope that you'll think of these things as you start to approach corporations or businesses to partner. Employee satisfaction is much higher where employees are allowed the time to volunteer and get engaged with nonprofits. Their retention is higher and their um, employee sat, uh, happiness is much higher. It literally increases employee happiness. Um, there are opportunities for professional develop on, development on both sides. So volunteers can come in, learn a little something new, apply what they know, know to help you with IT or with marketing or with whatever it is. Um, and it increases professional development on both sides. 
Um, public image is really important for corporations and businesses, especially now with social media. Um, things get out pretty quickly that are good and bad. Um, and so they're looking to improve their public image by engaging with community organizations. And then the marketing. You wanna make sure that's typically the number one thing that we think about when we think about corporate sponsorship is, is, or corporate engagement. They want the marketing, right? They want the exposure to your um, stakeholders. So these are the ways to set up a win-win-win situation with corporation or business partners. To get started, start making a list of potential partners. Just start thinking about either the type of industries that you'd wanna partner with or the type of actual businesses you'd want to. Um, partner with, just make a big list. Um, and then lean on your connections. So start to figure out, and LinkedIn is a great tool for this, um, who works at those organizations, who on your board is connected to those organizations. Um, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna target a corporation to be a partner of yours, consider recruiting one of their employees as a board member. It's a great way to get good engagement. It's one of the things they look for, in fact. Um, offer some solutions to the business that fit those areas we just talked about. Figure out your price tag, right? How much sponsorship do you want? How much volunteer time do you need? How many volunteers do you need? But sort of figure out your, your, your pricing, right? Quote unquote, in a broad sense, especially, you know, what is a sponsorship? How much is it? And what are the benefits? Everybody kind of is already is in that vein, I think. Um, Present your vision and goals for the partnership and see if they have the same ideas or if they like those. Um, set up strategy meetings with the corporation and then make sure you're communicating throughout with the corporation. I think we often in the nonprofit world think we don't wanna bother people, but they the, the engagement will increase the more you communicate meaningfully with your partners. Just some final thoughts, and I'm gonna end here <laughs> with hopefully some time for questions if you have them, but I always like to end my presentations this way because I believe it. You are a superhero. If you're working in the nonprofit world, you are a superhero. Doing whatever it takes is not sustainable for you. If you're doing whatever it takes in your organization, you're gonna burn out and burnout is real. And we really can't have you burnt out because there's too much work out there. Um, and we depend on you. So, um, so take care of yourself, right? Be focused and take time for reflection, thinking and planning. It took me um, working for a consulting firm, doing billable hours and my boss saying to me, reflection, thinking and planning is work time. I was like, oh, you know, I thought it had to be like creating stuff at all times, but anyway, so take time for reflection, thinking and planning. Um, set some routines and stick with them. Block schedule and eliminate distractions. Engage in self-care. Put your oxygen mask on first. We cannot have you not having your oxygen mask on, right? The world needs you at your best and we're, help, we're here to help you figure it out. So reach out for anything um, related to your nonprofit. I'm happy to have conversations with people. So if you want more, you can schedule a 30 minute session with me. I'm happy to chat with you with no pressure. Just love the thought partnership. Um, ask questions, spitball ideas, think aloud, share frustrations, brainstorm solutions, and see if I can help you. I have lots of things at my fingertips I can send you. Any questions? Libby, we had a question in the chat. Um, since Great. the pandemic, corporations have had um, to cut some of their donations and marketing dollars. What, um, what is the, your source of information that corporate donations are still important and available? Orga so corporations absolutely are still engaging in partnerships and giving away sponsorship dollars. They cannot afford to, to not do corporate social responsibility. Um, you know, it, maybe it might be harder um, and there are some businesses certainly who are struggling financially. There are also a lot of businesses who have had a boom during this whole thing. Um, so, I, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not that everybody's taken a, a bad hit. You know, the stock market has been high. Um, and so there are businesses that are, um, are in great shape and giving more money than ever. 
Um, I will tell you that one easy way to get some help is to apply for Google marketing dollars. They give $10,000 grants for marketing all the time, constantly, lots of it. You can get a $10,000 grant from Google pretty easily if you want to, you know, increase your presence. And, you know, Google rules the internet. Um, so if you're not doing anything else, get make sure your Google My Business page is done and and add to it on a weekly basis, add pictures, collect people's comments and make that thing robust because that controls how you show up when somebody Googles. Um, so yeah, the, it, it is a challenge. It's a little, I think it's a little bit more difficult for some businesses. So I don't mean to negate the corporate sponsorship thing, but it, it is, there are a lot of businesses that are doing fine and want meaningful partnership. So they have to keep their reputation score high, uh, especially now. And especially if you offer marketing, you know, if you're opening up, you know, yeah. if you're putting their logo and stuff out where your clients or stakeholders will see it, um, that's important to them. It's a great question. What else do we have in here? I didn't see anything else in the chat, but if anybody wants to unmute themselves, if you have other questions for Libby or even Ella or um, Ashley and Jennifer from the library, you can certainly do that now. I know we're getting very close to 1030, so I want to be respectful of everybody's time and certainly say thank you, um, but you are welcome to unmute and ask questions. And don't hesitate to just sidebar. Oh, Yemi, did you have a question? Hi, good morning morning. Thank you for your presentation. So it seems like you focused a lot on nonprofits. Can you spend like two seconds on for profits who are actively seeking um, corporate sponsorships? Yeah, so I, I meant to say that at the beginning that that word nonprofit organization was everywhere, but it works the same way business to business. And um, I would approach it in the same, same, same way. The only thing that's different is there are no stakeholders, stockholders in nonprofits, right? Or no, nobody's, you know, getting paid to be on a board or anything like that. But yeah, it works the same way. So it's a great question. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, Joe. Thank you. This was great. Thank you so, so much um, to our presenters today. We had such um, great information. And again, this is being recorded. We'll be sharing the link with everybody who registered for today. Um, and just wanna say thank you all so, so much. Ella, Libby, Jennifer, and Ashley, you guys all did an amazing, ladies all did an amazing job. Um, and we honestly cannot thank you enough um, for your your knowledge and your experience and um, hopefully making this a memorable experience for you as you continue um, through your everyday um, business growth and development. So um, if there is nothing else, I just wanna say thank you guys again. I hope everybody stays safe and warm out there today and hopefully this is it for snow. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Um, but thank you all, and we are right at 1032, so thank you, and um, we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Have a good day.